We've arrived now at the intermission during today's Philadelphia Orchestra concert, and here is the program annotator for the orchestra, George Deal. Thank you, Jim. Two distinguished American singers, Beverly Sills and James McCracken, have just delivered the rather voluptuous duet, O Suave Fanchula, by Puccini, from his uh, famous opera La Boheme. And uh, it has been quite a chore for me to take them away from the applauding audience, but it is my pleasure to invite both of them to our intermission microphones and to welcome them to Philadelphia and to applaud them personally for their marvelous appearance in uh, this 150th, 115th, I beg your pardon, I'm aging the grand old lady of Locust Street, <laughs> the 115th birthday of the grand old lady of Locust Street, which we, uh, as we affectionately call her, the Historic Academy of Music. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Uh, for our listening audience uh, who perhaps heard you fading on the microphones in, at the end of the duet, we should perhaps mention that uh, since this is not television, you walked off stage arm in arm, right? Uh, yes, that was Beverly's idea. She <laughs> thought we ought to get out while the getting was good. <laughs> <laughs> Clever. <laughs> but rapidly called back. Uh, did you also walk on the red carpet down to the academy for this concert? I feel, of course, we're, we're both staying in a hotel a, l a little distance from the uh, academy, and we both felt that the carpet should have at least extended from the Barclays. Yes, so certainly, uh, <laughs> it's, it's only a mile. Yes, <laughs> well, the, car the, the carpet goes to where the, uh, the ball, the celebratory <laughs> ball, will be after we're the looking concert. Forward to that. Yes. Uh, opera singers are supposed to be temperamental. Uh, I don't know whether uh, the uh, breed of opera singers has changed. I'm sure it has, because as I watch both of you in rehearsal and in performance at this concert, uh, you are quite normal people. No temperament. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, plenty of temperament agreed. in the singing. To be a prima donna, or to be. Uh, what do you call a man that's a prima donna? A primo donna. Primo donna. Don. <laughs> <laughs> uh, takes a lot of energy, and uh, we need our energy to, to sing and mm -hmm. to perform. So I believe that uh, these people that have their uh, tantrums in the dressing room are wasting some of it, and it could be a mistake. True. I, I'm opposed to leaving any part of my performance in the dressing room. And then anyhow, here we are with one of the great orchestras in the world, yes. with such a, a luscious sound. When they started up that Puccini <laughs> thing, we both sort of swooned. And you have a, a, a marvelous conductor standing on the podium. Uh, what's to be nervous or temperamental about? It's all, it's all going our way, and it's a festive gala night. It's a lot of fun. I'm curious, when you do emote uh, during performance, have you, uh, have you ever actually cried? I have, yes. So have I, and yes. it is a mistake. Beverly's absolutely right. It is right. a mistake. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. uh, you want the audience to cry, and if, you, if you're doing it yourself, uh, you're, you're losing a lot of, uh, of emotion that should be going across the footlights. Mm -hmm. Seems to be what oh, happens. Oh, yeah. And it also, it, it does in some way affect your vocal production. I was going to ask you know, what, what it does to you vocally. Uh, well, you, you know, the authors frequently describe that the right before you cry, how the throat tightens and so forth. And I wept during one performance I did of Swore Angelica years ago. I'd had a rather difficult week the week I decided to do that. Uh, I did the trilogy that night. I did all the three. Mm. And I broke down in this one, Angelica, when she talks about the little baby dying yes. without its mama. And that just ruined me. Not to change the subject, but uh, Bellini and Donizetti are on the boards again, aren't they? <laughs> Forever as a and ever. Uh, Thanks as a to Beverly. Of yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, a great repertoire. And I, you know, the, the renaissance of it was really started with Maria Callas some years ago. Yes. It certainly uh, has been a battle fought by uh, Callas and Miss Sutherland and myself, and I, I think we are keeping it alive. But it is still Puccini that brings the house down, isn't and it? And why not? Yes. Why not? Well, one, um, of course, Puccini it, it, it's doesn't use the voice as the showpiece. The voice uses the music as the showpiece. Exactly. There are times when I think it's the orchestra, the last uh, seven or eight measures of the Nessun Dorma. There's no voice involved in it at all. It's all orchestra, and it's magnificent. It really is. Well, you know, with Puccini, it's more uh, a, a collaboration. It is. The voice must ride over Absolutely. somehow, ride over the orchestra, 
Uh, but uh, the orchestra is there to ride on, which right. makes it fun. Yes. But Donizetti and Bellini wrote for an entirely different purpose. Mm -hmm. I mean, that era of, of bel canto, bel canto right. was mm -hmm. vocal display. And um, Puccini and Verdi That is pretty wrote. much the soprano's domain, is it yes. not? Yes. It's mm -hmm. funny, we, we were talking about it yesterday at lunch, um, that... Um, the dramatic tenor who does Otello and Andrea Chenier, when somebody says, oh, I'm going tonight to hear Otello, they never say, who's singing Desdemona? They say, who's the Otello? The reverse, of course, if you say, I'm going to hear Luci di Lammermoor tonight, they say, oh, who, who's the soprano? Never ask who the tenor is. So that, of course, the more gratifying repertoire for the soprano is the bel canto repertoire, and the more gratifying repertoire for the tenor is the dramatic tenor roles, the Aidas, the Forza del Destino, the Gioconda, the Andre Chenier, the of Otellos. Course. I mean, this is, the, of course, Jimmy is the Otello of his generation. There's no question about that. And of course, and with a singer like Mr. McCracken, the uh, tenors are bel cantoing all the time. Yes. Well, of course, <laughs> the term, needless to say, is, yes. is greatly uh, mishandled yes. today. It, it has and other One must never forget too. the translation of bel canto, which is still beautiful singing. Mm -hmm. You know, and it doesn't really belong to one particular repertoire. Have either of you ever been a one-of singer? Do you know what I mean by a one-of singer? Like one of the Valkyries, one of Me? the Rhine Maidens? Oh, yes. <laughs> have, have either of us. Either. Well, I, I'm, you you, you, you've that. never been one of the Rhine Maidens. No, but, but I've been one of the Meister singers. I've been really? one of the Jews in Salome. I've been one I'm, of... Yeah, I've been one of the slave of, girls in Electra. I was the lesbian it. slave girl yeah. in Electra. I was Gerhilde in the San Francisco Opera These are two Valkyrie. American singers that came up like scratching against the wall. God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, oh. I don't know of two others that have, that have had to, to do the things we've had to. I God. really don't. My We're big starring role was Frasquita here yeah. in Philadelphia. Yeah. Yeah. Messenger and Aida was my big part. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you sang it slowly. <laughs> what, uh, what turned the trick? Yes, exactly. Once upon a time, they were looking for an Otello and couldn't find one, and I just have yeah. to... Once upon a time, they were looking for a Cleopatra mm -hmm. in Julius Caesar, and there I was. Uh, we were talking before about the, uh, uh, not while we were on microphone, but, uh, but earlier uh, today, about the uh, taxing schedule of singers. Uh, how many performances is a singer good for, say, during the course of a year? I'd say it depends on the singer and the repertoire comes and goes to we have uh, you maybe I've done seven performances already in 1972 well uh, you, I want I, I'm going to not keep that pace up there'll be times when you'll have a little time off too so that if you average in the in a whole year around 50 with our kind of repertoire that's plenty that's plenty you don't want to do much more than that I think you lose your voice yeah and I would say that if you do much more than that that it's going to not only the voice will suffer but the performance mm. as well mm. even the physical energy uh, after all 50 in 365 days sounds like one every seven nights, but it, um, it doesn't work out that way, right. you know, because one, we do have to have holidays. We do have to spend travel time. And we have rehearsal periods. And rehearsal periods wh yeah. where you're singing, That's although the, the public point. doesn't yeah, hear it. Three or four weeks rehearsals uh, is an awful lot of singing, and yet that doesn't uh, count in, doesn't the, count in the 50 yeah. performances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, I, for instance, I find I have one particular concert program that knocks me out much more than an opera. And then I have one concert program that I can do when I, you know, when, I, when I'm not even really feeling like doing a concert. I can always pull myself together enough to concentrate on it. Mm -hmm. I think it's just there are There are certainly are operas that are easier than others, too. Sure. I've just been doing Samson, and I find it an easy opera, one of the few, but it is uh, somehow, for me, uh, well, a breeze, you sure. know, and I, people say, oh, Samson, a breeze, you know. Yeah, well, listen, after you belt through the orchestration of a Verdi hotel, yes, and then somehow suddenly come I over to Samson, yeah. La triste, uh, some of those yeah, phrases, I think, you know, you can really coast, yeah. yeah. Do either of you feel that you have a flair for uh, a characterization other than that called for by the roles that you are, that you are noted for, the roles that you sing? Well, I'm sure that Someone I Someone once asked Bergman yeah. some time ago, you know, and she says she's tired of dying. I'm sure I have a flair for comedy, but I don't know of one opera where I could, uh, uh, of course, Beverly is... is uh, is a real comedian, there's no doubt about that. But I think, too, that you're talking in terms of flair, I think I could uh, do comedy somehow if, I, if it were uh, Look, built I'm around me somehow. I'm uh, sure, uh, for instance, that if a performance, a production of Fledermaus were geared so that Alfred, just as an example, uh -huh. 
were geared to someone like yourself, that it could be terribly funny. Maybe, yeah. You know, Something I like just, that. I've never done it. I'm, I yeah, well, now I've sung Rosalinda, uh -huh. although basically Rosalinda is low and heavy. Yeah. But, you know, I've gotten through it. And you've had fun And I've had a ball. Sure. And been you know, a big because success because you have that flair. tailored to my kooky mm -hmm. uh, humor, uh -huh. you know, and I... I uh, they, did, they said I played it like Lucille Ball with a soprano voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you've had that realization of being able to, I mean, the idea would be that it, he asked if you had a flair. I don't really know, but I kind of would like to try. I'm sure yeah. you could. I think if you have a good sense of humor, you can appreciate a comic situation. Mm -hmm. I think if you're a dud, it wouldn't matter what kind of flair you of had. You simply wouldn't be able to adapt into the situation of the, the comedy at the moment. Yes. Intermission is almost over, and I think uh, we shall all adjourn back into the Academy of Music now to hear uh, Maestro Friebeck de Burgos in a performance of the three dances from the three-cornered hat of Defaya, and then Vladimir Ashkenazi in the uh, Rachmaninoff Rhapsody. I want to thank both of you for joining me and to thank you again for coming to Philadelphia for the 115th anniversary concert. My guests have been Beverly Sills and James McCracken. <laughs>